James Day, public television pioneer and chairman of the CUNY TV Advisory Board, passed away in April 2008. His legacy includes the series Day at Night, which aired for 130 episodes beginning in 1973. The program features interviews with many of the great thinkers and achievers of the 20th century. These 30-year-old programs have been restored. The interviews remain fresh and relevant today, exploring issues that are still important to society. Showing them again is CUNY TV's tribute to Jim and his contributions to public television. Kurt Waldheim is an Austrian by birth and a diplomat by choice. He's twice been his country's permanent representative to the United Nations and for two years was its foreign minister. In 1971, he was chosen to be the Secretary General of the United Nations, the fourth to hold that position, once described by one of his predecessors as the most impossible job in the world. Ironically, he was given the most impossible job as a birthday present. His selection by the Security Council came on his 53rd birthday. But if it is an impossible job, he came to it with wide open eyes and more than 30 years of diplomatic experience under his cummerbund well armed with the delicate skills required to juggle the problems of dealing with a community of 135 independent and sovereign member nations. <laughs> Mr. Secretary General, you've been in that position now for two years. I'm wondering whether you've had any opportunity to speculate about the kinds of personal qualities that uh, are best for a Secretary General, the ones that seem to be most required in that very difficult job. Well, uh, I think this is a good question. Uh, I think what you need uh, most is patience, perseverance, and uh, uh, tolerance. Tolerance. Yes, because you have uh, 135 member states in the United Nations. They are coming from all parts of the world. So you cannot expect that they understand you immediately. You have uh, to have patience, you have to explain things. And then you find out very soon that uh, people all over the world want the same uh, peace, to live in peace mm -hmm. with their families. But you have uh, uh, to get them uh, to understand that uh, people have been educated differently. They have different religions, different colors. They are coming from a completely different uh, background. Mm. Therefore, I think uh, it is very important to help them. And for this, you need patience, perseverance, and as I said, tolerance. Somewhere you were quoted as saying it also required good health and good nerves. Well, this is certainly true, uh, and I experienced this uh, the truth of this statement I made at the beginning, it needs uh, good health, it needs good nerves, uh, it is a tough job. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt about this. It was described by Trig Valley, I believe, as, an, as the most impossible job in the world. Knowing that, why did you take it? Well, I didn't really believe it, but uh, since I am now in this job for more than two years, I think he was right. It is one of the uh, most impossible jobs because whatever you do, and you have to do something, you cannot just lean back and say, let others do the job. You have to do it. But there will always be a fraction in the membership which doesn't like what you are doing. So this is probably what Rick Willey uh, meant when he said it's the most impossible job because you have uh, the whole world uh, represented in that organization. You have to make decisions. And you cannot avoid uh, from time to time that uh, your decisions are not accepted by one or the other side. That's simply taken for granted. That well, more or less, of course. Uh, uh, you see, the Secretary General has two possibilities uh, to be helpful, uh, to be active. And he has to be active. But he has to know when he has to be active. <laughs> Sometimes it's not good to mm -hmm. be active. Sometimes, of course, it is to the advantage of the cause. He has the two possibilities, either to make public statements, for instance, in humanitarian questions, or to use quiet diplomacy. Well, uh, it's up to him to decide when uh, to make public statements and when to use his quiet diplomacy. Mm -hmm. 
But his power is limited, is it not, by the... Oh, yes, it's very limited. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think uh, the Secretary General has to know his limits. Uh, he cannot uh, go beyond certain limits. Uh, there is the Charter, there are the rules of procedure, uh, there is the attitude of the member states. They do not always like uh, too much activity uh, of the organization as such. But I think uh, the Secretary General can uh, do a lot if he uses his uh, power, his moral power, in the right way. And therefore, public statements uh, can be of uh, great importance uh, in the positive and, of course, also in the negative <laughs> sense. So he has to be uh, careful in choosing the right time and uh, the right cause for this. Is that limitation upon power a source of frustration for you, or you, have you simply accepted that as a part of the job? Well, uh, it causes some frustration. Yes. No, I wouldn't deny this. Uh, very often I would like to do more, uh, to be more active, uh, to uh, mm, come to the help of uh, people in a, a more outspoken way. And uh, it is not always possible. Uh, even if you make proposals or suggestions, they are not always accepted. But all in all, uh, the Secretary General has also the great satisfaction that uh, he can do a lot uh, through quiet, preventive di diplomacy. But you see, <laughs> my problem here is that I cannot talk about these things. Uh, whatever I do behind the scenes, uh, quietly, in my personal contacts with heads of state, you know that I just came back uh, from a long trip through mm -hmm. Africa and I talked to so many heads of state. I could uh, 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 discuss uh, certain problems, and we could solve one or the other problem. But uh, sometimes these things are very delicate, and you cannot uh, talk to the public about them. So the public doesn't really know about this positive aspect of the work of the Secretary So indeed General. it's quiet and secret diplomacy to that extent. Well, sometimes it's necessary. Mm -hmm. You cannot always uh, uh, say everything. You apparently decided to become a diplomat or a foreign service officer rather early in your life. It's written about you that you decided when you were still in secondary school. That's correct, yes. Uh, uh, I, it was always uh, uh, my interest to become uh, once a diplomat, even when I was a small boy. I don't Did you know come from I a family that had been engaged in public service? Uh, uh, yes, my father was a public servant, and uh, but uh, I never wanted to, uh, to serve in, in the country. I always wanted to uh, serve uh, my country outside, uh, and that was the reason why I thought uh, diplomacy is the right job for me, and uh, uh, my father was very good to me. He enabled me. Uh, to uh, go to the Diplomatic Academy in Vienna. I'm not coming from a rich family, so it was a sacrifice for my uh, father and for my mother. Uh, so one had to pay to go uh, to oh the yes, Diplomatic Academy. Oh, yes, it was a rather expensive school. At the same time, I was studying law at Vienna University, mm -hmm. so finally I had to do degrees, a, a Doctor of Law degree and at the Diploma of the Diplomatic Academy, which is something like you have here in Colombia, for instance, the School of International Affairs. Mm -hmm. You said that your boyhood was filled with hardship. You yes. say you did not come from a wealthy family. That's so. correct, yes. As I told you, my mm -hmm. father was a civil servant, and uh, the years between the two world wars were terrible for Austria. Mm -hmm. The great empire uh, broke down in 1918, the year I was born. Mm -hmm. My mother had quite some trouble to find food for me. There was really nothing in mm -hmm. Austria in the first years after the war. So uh, the later years were a little better, but uh, it was always rather hard. Uh, for instance, I had to give private lessons to other people, to other youngsters, in Latin, in Greek, <laughs> and in other matters. Uh, you were earn, yourself a earn, good student. To then. earn additional money for, for my own study at uh, Vienna University. You were a good student then? Well, uh, I had never traveled. Mm -hmm. Was there uh, some romance in the idea of traveling outside your country and in diplomacy? Well, uh, I don't know whether I should call it romance. Uh, I, I wanted to see the world and I wanted to work for my country abroad. Uh, I think these were the two elements mm -hmm. which led me to try to become a diplomat. Your studies at the University of Vienna in law were interrupted, were they not, by, by the war and by the German invasion of Austria. Is that the proper term? It was certainly an invasion in our terms. 
Uh, well, uh, it was called the Anschluss, and uh, it was a very sad experience for Austria. You were a student at the time. I yeah. was a student, and uh, uh, my family, uh, my father and my mother, as we, the children, we were stunned. Uh, uh, patriots. Uh, we uh, suffered quite a bit after the Angelus. Uh, my father was put in prison and uh, my whole family suffered. Why was uh, your father put in prison? Well, because he was very outspoken uh, before 38 and in the, especially in the last phase uh, uh, against uh, uh, this development, uh, against the Anschluss, uh, against Nazism and uh, afterwards he had to pay for it uh, and the whole family, uh, our property was confiscated etc. So it was a, it was a very sad uh, uh, period for my family as it was for so many Austrians. Mm -hmm. What about you yourself at that time? Depressed I suppose by events? And uh, uh, well uh, we were all very shocked about what happened mm -hmm. and I still remember my father saying the light powers would, would, will never permit this happening. It was just uh, a few weeks before it happened. And uh, as a young student, uh, seeing what uh, happened, reading carefully the international press, etc., I, I didn't agree with him. I, I said, look, uh, I'm afraid it could happen if uh, the outside world doesn't help us. Well, and that was exactly what happened. Uh, nobody really helped us. And I think I have to say this. Uh, uh, we alone, a small country, uh, couldn't defend ourselves. Uh, we would have needed uh, help from the outside, from the big mm -hmm. powers uh, mm -hmm. around us, but uh, that didn't happen. And ultimately you were drafted into the German army? That's correct, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a strange uh, situation and uh, I think uh, people here on this side of the uh, <laughs> Atlantic don't always understand this. Uh, that my uh, father was persecuted, the whole family was persecuted, uh, and still uh, the two sons, I have a brother and a sister, mm -hmm. the two sons were drafted. Well, that was the system, and if you refused, well, there was no choice, you would have been killed. And so you found yourself killed. fighting for a cause that well, you opposed. Ex exactly, mm -hmm. but, but fortunately for a very limited time, because I, I was wounded very soon, and then I was dismissed from the uh, army and could continue my studies. You mentioned the yes. interruption. Uh, so I could then uh, uh, continue my uh, law studies at Vienna University. Mm -hmm. Why was Austria occupied by the Allies after the war since it had opposed the Well, uh, of course, uh, there were also people in Austria supporting the Anschluss. Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't deny that, mm -hmm. and uh, you know that as well as I do. Uh, but uh, I think here one has to understand the tragic situation of uh, little Austria um, after the First World War. After the breakdown of the big empire, which was one of the dominating factors in uh, European history and in world history, uh, Austria, what, what, what was, was left over was a tiny little republic of six and a half million inhabitants out of 60 million. And um, they had nothing. Uh, it was an economic problem in the first place. Uh, uh, people didn't know how to survive. The hinterland was gone. It was uh, separated from uh, the Republic. So uh, uh, people uh, were really in a desperate situation. And uh, 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 there was this huge propaganda, the Nazi propaganda, saying, well, uh, uh, if uh, the Anschluss comes, if you join us, everything will be fine, life will be happy again, etc., etc. I remember when I was still at the university, there were colleagues of mine who were just one or two years older, they were jobless after they had finished their studies. And uh, they told me, you are stupid to continue your studies. It's better you stop it because you won't get a job afterwards anyway. So this is uh, one of the uh, main reasons why there was a certain uh, mood in Austria. They say, well, if you have to choose between life and death, uh, let's choose uh, a chance uh, to survive. You finished your studies at the university and got your law degree before the war ended. Uh, no, I finished uh, the studies as such, uh, but not with a law degree. I the see. law degree I got later mm -hmm. uh, uh, in '44. So that you entered the foreign service, uh, or uh, entered the foreign ministry of Austria at about the point where the war did end then? That's correct. Mm -hmm. Right after the war, uh, the war uh, was over in spring '45. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, for Austria in about April, uh, it lasted a little long in other parts of uh, the western, in the western parts of my country. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and then I was waiting, seeing how things would develop. Uh, and in, uh, for, in the fall uh, 1945, I started in the Ministry for Foreign Affairs, which is the old Palais Metternich, the famous Metternich, you know. Yes. It was his office, mm. uh, which is now since many years of uh, the headquarters of the Austrian Foreign mm. Office and the Austrian Prime Minister, the Chancellor, as we call him. And I started there in a half-destroyed building, because one half of the building was destroyed uh, by the war. There was fighting in Vienna, mm -hmm. as you know, between the light powers and uh, the uh, uh, troops. Uh, so it was a rather sad beginning. Mm -hmm. But it was a beginning at a time when the peace treaty was being negotiated, was it not? Well, I'm uh, very uh, proud that I uh, could, uh, that I was permitted to participate mm -hmm. in those negotiations mm -hmm. uh, for uh, when Austria was liberated uh, uh, in 45. Uh, we were occ still occupied, as you know, and uh, to our surprise, uh, that lasted again 10 years. Uh, first, we had these six years of uh, Nazis in Austria, and then uh, ten years of occupation uh, by the Allied powers uh, because it was not possible to agree on a treaty. Since we were not in a state of war with the Allied powers, since we were, uh, uh, as you say, yes. as, uh, uh, occupied first by uh, the uh, uh, Germans, uh, they said uh, we cannot uh, conclude a peace treaty with Austria and we insisted on this. So uh, it was a state treaty which was negotiated, namely a treaty to establish the new relations between the Republic of Austria and the rest of the world, especially the four allied powers. And I was in, uh, engaged uh, as a young uh, diplomat in these uh, negotiations. I traveled with our then foreign minister to uh, uh, Paris, uh, London and Moscow. And finally, after 10 years, uh, uh, the treaty was signed. But this too needed patience and perseverance, <laughs> yes, believe yes, me. Yes, I yes. learned it. <laughs> How did Austria avoid the fate of Germany of being divided between the two zones, the Allied, uh, the, uh, the Western zone and the Eastern zone? I think uh, uh, the answer is uh, that the people of Austria wanted to uh, remain united. There were efforts uh, to divide the country in an eastern zone and in a western zone. Uh, there was even the idea to choose Vienna as the capital for the eastern part of uh, Austria and Salzburg for the western parts. Well, we refused it categorically. And uh, never in my whole life I saw such a unity uh, amongst the people. Whenever this uh, idea was put forward to divide the country, everybody got up and said never. And I think uh, the uh, four powers understood that there is no chance uh, and, uh, uh, well, uh, it worked. Uh, uh, there were many difficulties to overcome, but uh, finally we had w one central government in Vienna all the time. There were demarcation lines when you had to travel from Vienna to Innsbruck in Tyrol, for instance. You had to cross uh, the demarcation lines. Uh, checked by the Russians or by uh, the Western uh, powers, uh, but uh, the political unity of the country was always maintained. Mm. And it was because of the will of the people uh, to remain a unity. Was it the will of the people to choose permanent neutrality in the new state of Austria? You've written a book, The Austrian Example, in which you talk about the advantages of neutrality for Austria. What, is, what are the advantages of neutrality and what is it? Well, uh, you must understand uh, that uh, we are a small country, now seven million uh, people, living in a very uh, neuralgic, difficult geopolitical uh, uh, situation between East and West, between the two ideological blocks of our world today. And uh, it was therefore evident uh, that uh, neutrality was uh, the best way out of a dilemma because uh, both side, uh, each side, uh, uh, I mean, uh, I, I'm talking now about uh, the big powers, yes. uh, uh, which we are still in Austria, uh, wanted us to join one or the other side. So we thought that the best uh, uh, solution is to adopt uh, neutrality like Switzerland, and we made it clear in the state treaty and in in the document, in the international documents, that it should follow the Swiss example to make very clear that it is a democratic neutrality mm. based on the system 
of uh, democracy, Western democracy, uh, like uh, the Swiss mm -hmm. uh, example. So I think uh, it was the right decision, and I tried to uh, explain that to our people in Austria how important uh, this uh, positive neutrality, mm -hmm. this active neutrality is for our country, and also to the world in general, because there are many misunderstandings mm -hmm. about our neutrality. We are not neutralists, we are a neutral country, uh, we want to participate actively in international affairs, but from the ideological point of view, it is very clear that uh, we are uh, following the ideology mm -hmm. of uh, uh, Western democracy. Mm -hmm. In 1971, you left the United Nations to go back to run for president of Austria and lost that election by a fairly narrow margin. And yet you had been out of the country most of the time since 1955, had you not? Well, perhaps this is the reason why I lost the elections. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you see, that was uh, really my great handicap. I was away for so many years as a diplomat, but I was uh, very proud that uh, I was able to rally so many uh, people behind me. And I think uh, one of the reasons was uh, the human contact. Uh, I was very active. I was uh, uh, making speeches, uh, 20 or more per day, in every little place. And mm -hmm. people learned to know me. And um, we started, I think, there was a Gallup uh, uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. poll. And mm -hmm. uh, I started with 27%. And finally, I got almost half of the vote. Uh, of the vote. So mm -hmm. uh, you see, uh, it was this personal contact, which in my opinion is a, a very decisive element in the human life, whether you are a politician, a diplomat, or any other. There is a individual. distinction between a politician and a diplomat. Oh, yes, very much. Uh, the politician has to be more outspoken, more direct than the diplomat. The diplomat, of course, has to be careful. It's, it's the nature of his uh, job. And I'm happy that I have the experience of both, uh, the uh, experience of a diplomat and the experience of a politician. Mm -hmm. Because for this job I have now, I need both. <laughs> <laughs> I see. This job you have now as Secretary General, one of the things that I've been curious about is working with an international bureaucracy. It must have its problems since your staff comes from your member nations. But I should think that would lead perhaps to a great deal of paperwork. I say this because the one time I had occasion to meet you in the past, one that you wouldn't have no reason to recall, a suggestion was made by one of your staff that a memorandum be prepared. And your reaction was, skip the memorandum and get the job done. <laughs> Has paperwork been something of a burden to an, an international organization? Yes, it is a problem. Mm -hmm. You are right. You are fully right. Uh, we, we are fully aware of this. And as you rightly remember, you have a good memory, uh, <laughs> uh, I was not too happy about uh, too much paperwork in our organization. And I have instructed the different departments uh, very soon after taking over uh, to reduce the paperwork. I think this is one of the criticisms of uh, the public, that we are producing a lot of paper, uh, but not enough concrete decisions. Yes. Mm. Well, uh, there is some truth in, uh, but uh, we are uh, doing our best to reduce the paper. Of course, you cannot avoid to have certain documents, etc. But I think you can only convince uh, the world and the public especially of uh, uh, your usefulness if uh, you uh, give proof uh, that you are really doing something about problems, that you are not only talking about uh, them, but you are doing something about it. And let me say this, uh, I'm happy that since last fall, the Middle East crisis, uh, the new uh, hostilities, and the role which the United Nations could play in this regard, has uh, have helped us uh, enormously mm. to create more credibility and to get more support for the United Nations. Because there we acted, we sent the peacekeeping force uh, there, we separated the belligerents and also the big powers. And uh, later on in the Geneva Conference, we could also play a useful, helpful role, mm. a practical role. And I think this is the important thing. The people have to see deeds, not just words. And I'm doing whatever I can hmm. to follow this course. Many Americans, as you know, Mr. Secretary General, are somewhat disillusioned. I think perhaps they held higher hopes than 
than uh, reason would support for the United Nations, and they feel it that so little has been done. These, this disillusion is not something that you share, quite obviously. Not at all. I think uh, uh, the reason for this uh, uh, is uh, that uh, people expected too much right at the beginning. We are not a world government. Uh, uh, we have our limitations, but uh, I think we are a very important uh, and useful instrument of peace if it is used by the member states. The problem really is that uh, the member states don't always uh, use uh, this instrument. How can you expect an instrument to work if you don't use it? Uh, but I think more and more people realize uh, that uh, we need both uh, uh, bilateral diplomacy, you see it, how it happened now, but also multilateral diplomacy. We have to support uh, those uh, powers who try to solve a problem. Mm -hmm. And this is exactly what happens, for instance, now in the Middle East. Again, uh, forgive me to come yes. <laughs> back again to this problem because it's such a typical example. There is bilateral diplomacy. Uh, Dr. Kissinger, uh, the Soviet Union, uh, uh, try to uh, solve the problem, but with our help, we have the peacekeeping force there, we are trying through quiet diplomacy also to help in the political field. I think this shows clearly how important uh, international uh, cooperation is, and of course the best place for this is still the United Nations. Would you hope for a United Nations which had as its membership every nation of the world one day? Well, we are almost universal today, mm. with uh, very few exceptions, all uh, states existing in the world are members of uh, the United Nations. Uh, I think universality is very important. Uh, how can you solve all these new problems uh, mankind is confronted with today, like human environment, the population problem, uh, the food problem, the energy problem? Uh, how can you solve this without international cooperation? We, we, we cannot do it uh, through confrontation. We need cooperation. Uh, dirt, for instance, pollution doesn't stop at the border. It uh, is everywhere practically. So you need the full cooperation of the whole world. Therefore, I think it is a good sign that we have reached uh, universality. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.